Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his, ten, his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Next Bible verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who, should, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we w once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone, in Christ, if any anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled to himself through, him, through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, in talking with Steve recently, I learned that your parish mission statement is building each other up in Christ and reaching out into the world for Christ. Did I get that right? All right, some of you know that, some of you, that might be new to you as well. And the vision of this church is to see multitudes around the throne with Christ. Now, I love that. It's big, and it's biblical. Well, God has planted you in Eagle Vale. And to fulfill your mission, to build each other up in Christ and reach out into the world for Christ... And for you to be a part of that, for you to contribute, it will require heart and skill. Heart and skill. What kind of skills? Well, skills that demonstrate you care. Things like empathy. Uh, good listening skills. Being able to share your faith story in an interesting way. And the ability to explain the gospel using simple, ordinary language. And there's so many other skills that we want to gain to be able to reach out into the world for Christ. But I believe that heart trumps skill. Heart trumps skill. Give me somebody with heart any day before someone with just skills. That's a heart for God and a heart for your neighbor. To actively participate in fulfilling your mission, it's going to stretch you and cost you something. Now, most of you know this. Now, on Friday mornings where I live in North Arm, North Arm Cove, there's a Pilates session. My wife, Janie, goes, I've been. I hate it. It hurts. All that stretching, ugh! Now, on Good Friday, I was struck by the 
Anglican colleague that we prayed where I worship on Sunday mornings, and I want to make it our prayer this morning for our time together. So let, let's pray. Merciful God, who gave your son to suffer the shame of the cross, save us from hardness of heart, that seeing him who died for us, we may repent, confess our sin, and receive your overflowing love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this morning I want to make an appeal to our hearts so that we would have a more tender heart toward God and particularly to our neighbors so we could reach out into the world for Christ starting right here in Eagle Vale. Now Colin read our gospel reading this morning from Matthew. Now if you've got your Bibles or it's on your phone, let me invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. We're going to skip over to 2 Corinthians back to Matthew 9. So feel free to move along with me through the Bible as we, as we reflect on it. Now, this section, this little section, 35 to 38, in Matthew's Gospel, serves a dual role. Firstly, you'll notice it's not something specific about Jesus' ministry. It's a summary. And in fact, it's a summary of Jesus' ministry recorded from chapters 5 through 9. And secondly, it serves to introduce what is the parallel mission of Jesus' followers, his disciples, that begins in chapter 10. And there in chapter 10, Jesus gives his disciples authority to go and to proclaim the gospel of God's kingdom. The kingdom of God is near. So Matthew, in this little section, is getting us to look back to reflect on all that Jesus has done, and then to begin to look forward and to see the continuity of these two sections. So in verse 35, Matthew describes Jesus' ministry for us. He says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And then Matthew goes on to provide a description of, of what Jesus sees and what he feels as he moves about. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now imagine, if you will, Jesus standing and looking out among the crowds. We see him in a crowded house when the roof, man comes through the roof. We see him sharing the good news from a boat on the seashore. We see him in a synagogue or in the temple or on a hillside looking out into the eyes of 5,000 hungry men, women, and children. What does he see? What does Jesus see? Well, he sees people as they really are, harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. He's looking beyond the surface level issues, beyond the facades that are raised, and he sees people's true condition. The word harassed here means to, to be mangled, torn apart, or cut to the bone. And the word helpless means to throw to the ground. So Jesus saw these people the way his father saw them. Victims of the enemy, hurt, betrayed, abused, torn apart, beat down, discarded, walked on with no one to care for them. Now what were the issues facing these crowds in the first century? Well, we know that many of them were poor and just struggled to survive. Others had ample material resources, but they were lonely and miserable within. There were people robbed of true rest, perhaps because of their own poor decisions, but also by the uncaring, unfair, and unjust ways of society. They were exhausted, just coping with the daily challenges of life. Now, what do we see in Australia in 2024? I think it's quite a troubling time. In my role, we get a lot of research papers and statistics about all sorts of things affecting people's financial well-being. 
there's so much evidence that it's a disturbing time. And just this week, uh, on, in the news and in the papers, you might have heard uh, something about this research uh, from the Salvation Army. I want to share a bit of that with you. They surveyed 1,500 people that came to them over the last 12 months for financial relief. So these are people that, by definition, have already been experiencing some level of financial distress. And so they surveyed these 15 people, and they found that 94% of respondents reported resorting to extreme measures to reduce their household bills. This includes drastically reducing the use of daily essentials with 43% unable to afford heating and cooling. 43%. 61% unable to afford medical, dental, and eye care. One 49-year-old woman said, I've had to go without food, clothes, showering, toiletries, and basic necessities just so that I could pay my rent and bills to keep a roof over my head. This is Australia. These are our some of these people are our neighbors. 69% of respondents said they go without food so their children can eat. Almost half of the respondents said they showered or washed less, often to save money, with 22% living in darkness or using candles or torches at night. One 42-year-old woman said, I've got behind in my gas and electric bills to make sure I've had petrol in my car to get to work and my children are fed. Now, if you've got children, households with children were particularly struggling. 69% of the respondents in this research admitted they went without food so their children could eat. 13% reported their kids went to school hungry. 21% said their children went to school without a packed lunch, and 7% said their children experienced a whole day without eating. There's so much disturbing evidence that we're living in an unprecedented time here in the, in the lucky country. Also this week, there's some research released that helps explain what others are talking about as a major societal problem, as a, as a mental health crisis among our young people. So the Australian child maltreatment study found nearly one in five young people aged 16 to 24 have been sexually assaulted by another teen. One in five. Professor Ben Matthews is the lead author. He says this, we're talking about very, very substantial numbers of adolescents who are now experiencing sexually abusive behavior at the hands of their peers who in former generations were not. This is unprecedented. He goes on, there's a general well-established body of evidence that sexual abuse is extremely harmful, harmful for mental health and other health risk behaviors like cannabis dependence, smoking, self-harm, suicide attempt. The belief is that this rise in this kind of abuse is caused by social media and access to hardcore porn. And one of our government ministers was in the news this week talking about the concern that this will just be increased with the rise of AI, artificial intelligence. A Macquarie Uni study found more than half of boys reported that their first exposure to porn was between the ages of 12 and 14, and more than one quarter between the ages of 9 and 11. Now, these are just a few stats, but this is an indication that something is not right at home. Something is not right in our communities. Now, if any of this touches a tender spot for you this morning, I'd urge you to speak with Steve or one of the other church leaders so the church can support you. That's why church is so critically important to give you know, light and salt to their communities. Now, thinking about Jesus looking upon these crowds, what does he feel? What does he feel as he looks upon harassed and helpless sheep? Well, Matthew tells us that Jesus had compassion on them. A literal translation is pitied from his inmost bowels. A pain so deep that it has a physical manifestation. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had a deep pain in his guts because they were shepherdless. The message paraphrase says, his heart broke. He was moved with compassion. G. Campbell Morgan writes of this phrase, that is just a simple lattice window made up of crossing human words. Look through it 
and you will see the flaming glory of the infinite love of the infinite God. You will see the birthplace of everything that makes for the uplifting of man. The compassion of Jesus for the lost is the birthplace of everything that makes for the uplifting of man. What's Jesus' heart for Australia in our day? What's his heart for the lost sheep living in our community? Now, I believe when Jesus looks out upon the harvest fields of Australia, he sees people exactly as they are, shepherdless. His heart is broken. And this, I believe, is a very important starting point for you and I, for our church. It's the heart of Jesus. It's a heart full of compassion. That lost people, people that are struggling, people that are dysfunctional, people that are suffering, they really matter to God. That's what he's all about. And they should matter to us, his followers. So we need this kind of heart to be men and women who feel the heart of Jesus. A people who don't respond with judgment and condemnation, but whose hearts break for those that are harassed and helpless, no matter how much of it's their own fault. Now, perhaps our hearts were once indifferent to the plight of those battling around us. Let me remind you that what God says in Ezekiel 36, which is now fulfilled for those in Christ, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. If you're in Christ today, that's what God has given us. A heart of flesh. And my prayer this morning is that if our hearts have hardened over time, that they may be softened again. That we may let God's spirit work within us. That tenderizing work. So we might see what Jesus sees and feel what Jesus feels. Now, I find inspiration in Paul's words from 2 Corinthians 5, and I hope you will too this morning. The section from verse 11, just a few verses before where Colin began reading, is often titled The Ministry of Reconciliation, and Steve's been talking about this morning as well. Now, in that section, Paul is writing about the reconciling work of God to reconcile the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him, and giving us, you and I, the ministry of reconciliation. So a couple things I see here in verse 14. Paul says, for Christ's love compels us. So this is all about Paul's motivation, which I think needs to be our motivation. Now the verb used here that is translated compels, and sometimes in other translations, controls, Christ's love controls us, it emphasizes the continuous nature of pressure that was upon Paul. The source of that pressure is the love of Christ, unconditional, unfailing, unending. So like Paul, you and I have freely received Christ's unmerited love and its benefits through his once-for-all death. It's liberating. It's life-changing. It's a reality that includes forgiveness, peace with God, true rest, eternal life, oh my goodness, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, adoptions, adoption as sons and daughters into God's church, his family, and that's so critically important for human well-being. Now this love, the love of Christ, places a continuous pressure on us to freely give what we freely received. Christ's love compels us. So the primary motivation for our serving and sharing really needs to be God's love. It's the appropriate response to such love. The second thing in that verse is about our conviction. Paul goes on to say, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, that Jesus died for all. This is really about our level of confidence in the gospel. Paul's statement here is pointing back to the historic events of the cross understood in a particular way. That his death was once for all. 
Of this, Paul was convinced. Now, I find that really challenging. And I've got to ask myself the question, what's the depth of my conviction of Jesus' death on the cross for all? Do I write some people off because of how they're living or behaving or what situation or how they're raising their kids? Are you convinced how deeply, deeply enough to motivate you, despite all the good excuses we come up with, to be stretched and for it to be costly, to share this good news as a normal rhythm of your life, to volunteer, to train as a money mentor perhaps? Now what was the reason Jesus' heart broke? Well, there's many reasons. But he's the good shepherd. And they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep don't do too well without a shepherd. And this emphasizes the spiritual nature of the problem, of the condition. They had no one to look to, no one to lead and guide them, no one to take care of them. They were vulnerable to the wolves and thieves of the world and vulnerable, vulnerable to themselves as sheep tend to wander from the flock. They didn't know the good shepherd. Do you know anybody who fits that description? Of course we do. Now, Jesus not only sees people's plight, their lostness, their loneliness, their helplessness, but he also sees their potential. He sees what lost sheep can become. So having seen the crowds, Jesus turns to his disciples and tells them, the harvest, it's plentiful, but the workers are few. He sees the opportunity that these lost sheep represent. The harassed and helpless becoming a fruitful harvest. That's God's vision. It's an image of abundance, of flourishing. That's what Jesus sees. Do you see it? It's about a vision of what God's will might be for those we live among here in Eagle Vale, our family, friends, colleagues, neighbors. Now up to verse 37, Matthew's focus in chapter 9 has been on Jesus and his ministry of meeting people's needs as their loving shepherd. But then the focus shifts from Jesus to his disciples, to you and me. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In the verses that follow in chapter 10, Matthew is describing Jesus calling and giving authority to 12 apostles. They're asked to pray and then to go. And Jesus tells them, a few verses down, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Now that's not a very appealing image to me. It sounds rather vulnerable, a bit scary. And as you're thinking about Jesus here in this chapter sending out these apostles, I want to ask the question, do you think they know everything they need to know about Jesus and the kingdom? I don't think so. Do they have all the required experience they need? I don't think so. Are they going to be stretched and pay a cost? Absolutely. That's the pattern. But he's going to be with them as their good shepherd. And the same is true of you. Now we're being sent just like these into our community and into the lives of others. We're invited to participate in God's redeeming work to see lost sheep transformed by Jesus, to see them flourish. And as we participate, participate our starting point is to see as Jesus saw, to feel as Jesus felt, so that we can do as Jesus did. Now, as I've tried to emphasize to do this, it's going to stretch you and cost you something. I like what Ralph Martin says. He says, the sign of our professed love for the gospel is the measure of sacrifice we are prepared to make in order to help its progress. So let's just normalize. It's going to cost you something. That's okay. Get over it. Support one another in that. But that's our calling. That's our God. Now I'd like to finish with this exhortation. I think it's an exhortation from the book I'm currently reading called Jesus and the Powers. It's by N.T. Wright and Michael Bird. It's a brand new book out. I'd highly recommend it. And he says this. He's pretty hard hitting. It's him saying it, not me, so don't take offense at me. 
He says this, your church is not a retirement village for moralizing geriatrics. Your church is supposed to be more like a boot camp for soldiers of Jesus who go out into the world wearing the full armor of God, preaching reconciliation with God, loving their neighbors, sowing good deeds in the soil of hurting hearts, and becoming the scourge of the corrupt and the champion of the weak. We undertake these tasks in such a way as to make clear that Jesus is worthy of our worship. Such things are indeed the acts of worship that we lay before his feet. Let's pray. Merciful God, who gave your Son to suffer the shame of the cross, save us from hardness of heart, that we might see the harvest Jesus saw, feel the compassion Jesus felt, so that we might build each other up in Christ and reach out into the world for Christ to see multitudes around the throne with Christ. Amen.